hey friends welcome back to the channel and i hope you're having a great time here we are with the second episode uh, of how to build uh, how to build an editor with emacs lisp um i'm super excited about this video series just because i love to talk about emacs and i'm one of those annoying people who won't shut up about emacs um in today's episode i'm going to show you how to survive on your first day of using emacs if you're already an emacs user great you're doing good otherwise this episode might be able to help you a little bit first of all uh why even bother with emacs right um in my experience i i talked to um, many people about um, i don't know emacs different toolings and everything and people are kind of a member of one of two groups in the first group people usually like change their workflows and change the way they kind of uh, operate on daily basis just because uh, there's some already like pre-made tools for them so they kind of change their habits change their uh, workflows to match uh, against one of those tools right and after like they adapt those tools and try to use them uh, after a while uh, they feel comfortable with them right so they change themselves in order to use a tool and like uh, this group is like a uh, much larger than the second group and we can like make so many uh, examples there from desktop environments to editors to other tools like people usually uh, change themselves to kind of meet the requirements for these these tools and basically uh, they're happy with the uh, with the tools that they use uh, that's fair uh, obviously it's just uh, the matter of preference but in the other hand the second group which is uh, in my experience a much smaller group uh, people in the second group usually they like to be in charge they like to uh instead of changing their workflows and changing changing themselves to uh meet some requirements of other tools they want to change the tools that uh, they're using and they want tools that are easy to change easy to hack and basically they have a list of requirements uh, they know what they want and they are willing to like spend the time change the tools and create the environment for themselves that meet uh, their uh, requirements right so um it's kind of hard to say which uh, group you're in you have to kind of evaluate your requirements and stuff like that to figure out uh, which group uh, is more suitable for you but again in my experience sometimes people who are in the first group they don't really even thought about uh, whether they want to be in the second group or not they never tried it right that's the uh, like basically they grew up that way they always had some uh, they used something for a long time so they uh, got used to it but if they switch to the like if they move to the second group for a while they might like it so even if you're part of the first group it still makes sense for you to kind of have a taste of uh, living in the second group try to uh, trying to like change everything based on your requirement like create uh, well tailored tools for yourself and stuff like that so if you want to do that emacs is one of your best uh, kind of choices like you can do whatever you want with emacs right we'll see that in the future but why emacs if you ask people like literally if you google uh why you know emacs you're going to see so many you, you're going to find so many uh, uh blog posts I, I don't know articles about like why people love emacs and people come uh, come up with different uh different uh, i mean uh, pros for emacs right some people are like yeah org mode is amazing it's the best thing after uh sliced bread and stuff like that some people love lsp and the language support for emacs some people are like yeah whatever uh, weird language you uh, want to use emacs supports it uh, or emacs is super lightweight you 
that's objective kind of there's tons of plugins for emacs and so many other uh qualities for emacs but my answer to that question is totally different i'm using emacs for i don't know 2006 2007 or something for a long long time and in emacs standards i'm a new user so emacs is pretty old like you 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 might come across people who who are using emacs since the 80s and in compared to them i'm just like a new guy um but in my experience like while all of those uh, qualities are perfect and they're great emacs is great in those uh, uh, areas but in my experience after a while you you see emacs in a different way basically people think emacs is just an editor which which is a fair assumption but the fact is emacs is just a lisp environment right which happened to have a, like an editor attached to it so um there's a if you if you're uh, ever used python there's a, an editor for python that shipped with python called idle or something I, I even can't remember the name it's the same thing as emacs right so you can't think of python uh, like you can't think of elis in that context to be similar like python and the graphical environment that you see which we call emacs is that idle ed editor so at heart e emacs is really an lisp environment you can do whatever uh you can do with python ruby other languages you can do all of them with uh, uh, emacs and elisp as well there's no limitation um that's wrong there's some limitations but they don't uh kind of restrict you to uh, anything basically you can do whatever you want but you have to know about limitations of course and emacs being a lisp is really the difference right I don't know how much do you know about Lisp, but Lisp is really amazing in compared to many languages. I know it, it's a bold statement, but and especially about eLisp, which is like a really old Lisp. But after a while, uh, if you use Lisp, you, you you'll see why Lisp is like a different world. It's it's something else, right? It's totally something else, and it's really amazing. I even tweeted once, I can't remember the exact words, but it's like a lucky programmer might um, hear about Lisp in uh, his or her career. A uh, luckier programmer get to use Lisp and the luckiest one understand the Lisp way. It's really hard to explain um, Lisp just in one video or like it deserves its own uh, video series and everything. and. In this video series, we're going to learn Lisp quite a lot. But my point is, Lisp is amazing and Emacs being a Lisp environment is really a key feature and a key, uh, killer feature for Emacs. It's super easy to extend Emacs and hack Emacs. That's why we, uh, we're here. That's all uh, like this video series is all about that. And that's what we're going to do. That's uh, basically we're going to create an editor by extending like the base emacs right and compared to other editors like i don't know what editors you're familiar with but mostly if you want to extend editors like especially like those giant uh, editors out there uh, you have to like deal with some shenanigans I don't know down, download an sdk create plugins like in, in order to create a plugin you have to do some specific stuff i don't know some of them even you have to write javascript css html and stuff like that or rpc stuff in java or but depends on the editor right but in, in emacs since it's a lisp it's super easy to show you like a really quick example let me open up some random file like a c++ file right as you can see it's a it's a c++ file from llvm that i had open i i was uh recording another uh episode of the llvm series so this is a c++ file i what i can do here is 
to create a function, like a list function, e list function. Let's call it foo, right? Enter. Oops. T, yeah. And. Slash. Okay. I just defined a new function called foo that we can call interactively and when we call it, it's going to print out blah blah in the echo area. I'm going to talk about the details in the future. Uh, but if I evaluate the, uh, this list form here, don't worry if you don't, don't understand what the list form is or like what the hell is this. It's just a list code. Uh, and I'm going to evaluate it just right now at this place, right? When I evaluate it, as you can see on the top left, for a second, you saw, uh, you saw the symbol foo, like it, uh, you could have seen that. Okay, foo is defined now. And I can find foo. Um, actually, I might have a uh, inter. Oh, yeah, interactive. Sorry. Ooh. Don't save it. So if I reevaluate it, I, I should be able to find, yeah, foo in the list of functions that I have, right? And I can run it, and as you can see on the uh, bottom left corner, you can see the blah, blah message, right? I just added a function to my editor on runtime while it's running, and I can do, like, I basically can write anything in it, like that function can do anything, right? And I wrote it in a C++ file, right? Um, that's how, amazing lisp is like basically my running editor is a, like a lisp uh, REPL. i can interact with it i can uh, ask it to evaluate some code for me like it's amazing like i don't need to do any of other shenanigans that other editor has uh, might have right i just write whatever i want evaluate it and that's it and i can just write that function in a file whenever emacs like i want to start emacs I make sure that that file gets included and like uh, imported in my environment and that's it really that's how you extend emacs we're done with the video series but um it's really easy from now on we're going to take a look at uh, like different uh, things like um, we're going to start with basic stuff how to survive in the first day and then we, we're going to take a, a deeper dive in emacs list in the future episode we're, we're, today we're going to just talk about the basics um one other way of actually um thinking about uh, thinking about emacs is that like conceptually it's kind of wrong but it, it makes sense that emacs is just a framework to build your own editor um again it's literally not correct because framework is something else like it has its own definition but just to prove not prove my point just to kind of uh, explain my thoughts it might be a good explanation right it's a framework that lets you create your own editor it has a bunch of defaults if you're happy with the defaults fine but most people like 99.99% .99 of people change everything like change at least tweak some of the defaults of emacs before i start this uh before we continue forward i got some uh questions uh, after the first episode the first question that i got was what is the difference between doom Ema uh, space max fg42 and other uh emacs related bundles or editors or whatever so basically they're just different editors like right so doom emacs is one of the famous uh, emacs distributions or emacs editors or whatever if you call uh, like whatever you want to call them it's just the same thing that we're going to do to emacs the author of that uh, editor created a new editor based out based on emacs it has its own configuration system it uses like different set of libraries uh, the set of libraries that it uses might be different than space max or different than fg fg42 
it's the same applies for these two as well for example space max is tailored for people who are uh, coming from the vim environment it has like vim bindings and like it, it looks familiar to people with uh, vim experience and fg42 uh, FG that we're going to see in this video series is something kind of api driven um, editor right we're going to talk about it uh, a little more uh, more in the future but uh, the only difference is they all uh, uses emacs at uh, at their base but they created the different editor using uh, the base and the same foundation uh, somebody asked me uh, which one of these should i use depends on your taste you have to try them and figure out i can't uh, tell you uh, which one to use uh, personally uh, as i mentioned I use like I use FG42 because I created it, <laughs> uh, but the Space Max and Doom are pretty famous. So many users, up to you really. And how to install Emacs packages and Emacs itself? We're going to have a look at uh, this spe uh, specific topic in the near future. So I, I leave it for then. Emacs has a pack, uh, not just one several package managers that you can use to install packages and we're going to have a look at it in the future so let's start by some basic concepts and ui basics the the thing that you're seeing uh, right now is actually fg42 so i'm going to show you the like a raw emacs no configuration this is emacs with no configuration right um, as you can see it's kind of similar to other uh basic editors like we have a toolbar here we have some menu bar scroll oh by the way since i built my own emacs from source uh frequently this thing that you see is based on uh like the development version of emacs and i chose to kind of disable some of the functionality like the native scroll bar and things like that because i never use them right um this is how uh, emacs with, uh, without any configuration and like without anything look like so talking about frames first uh frames and windows um it, it's a bit com uh, confusing especially for uh, newcomers because in emacs uh, frame and window are kind of uh, they switch places so going back to the raw emacs so i just split my screen into two uh windows right we call these windows in emacs each of them are a window is a window right um but the frame itself is like the x window that you see so we have just one toolbar in in the current frame but we have two windows right if i split it uh further so we, now we have three windows and one frame in my experience you rarely uh want like you rarely end up with like more than one frame uh i know some people who have like multiple monitors and they chose to have one money one frame per monitor i'm not like that uh so it de it depends on your needs again and that's what we're going to do you're going to learn how to build the stuff that you need but uh to recap really quickly uh we have right now three windows these are small areas that we can actually type in are called windows and the entire uh thing that you see right now is a frame or uh, we can map an x11 window uh to a like an emacs frame x11 is like a, the uh, linux related uh linux specific i don't know to be honest about other operating system to uh, give you an example we have mod line so the thing that you see here this bar here that you can see on each uh, window is called mod line right this uh light gray area when you when we are in the active window you see this light gray area and on inactive windows you see it as like a dark gray uh line i guess so 
this is called mod line and you can replace it with other alternatives like as you as you see in fg42 i don't have that thing i moved it down uh to the bottom uh right uh, not just bottom right like it uh, occupies the uh basically the bottom section of my editor and since i have two editor running on each other like this thing that you see here is uh, is emacs running as my window manager and this is another emacs running in emacs right because like i increased the font size for video screen and everything that's why i run another one but in the in this uh raw emacs this is the actual uh, mod line that you'll see it usually contains some information about the window that you're in like the major mode minor mode uh and other stuff like the location of uh the current location in the buffer and things like that the second concept which is really confusing to some people is buffer so in other editors when you work with a file basically you see a tab for that file you open up a file you see a tab and you see the content of the file in emacs it's kind of different so we don't call it a file we call it a buffer because it's just a memory buffer whenever you visit a file or open a file uh, the content of the file is move like is emacs moves it to the memory and there's a buffer that kind of represent that chunk of memory and that's what you see uh, right now for example if i want to open a file this file like it's a new file right whatever i i write in this buffer is and when oops sorry when i save it it's going to be saved uh, on the disk but right now this buffer is the representation of that file in memory so if you're coming from other editors uh buffers are just like open files right but not necessarily files you might have a buffer in our example like a scratch um sorry since it's uh, vanilla emacs no configuration so for example this scratch buffer is just a buffer in memory it doesn't map to any file just a buffer in memory you can write in it and if you want you can still save it to the disk but it's there uh that's buffer and the next uh, thing is mini buffer and echo area so oh, it's really a small you might not be able to recognize it from, uh, on video uh, so there's a, like an empty section empty area underneath uh, these two windows right this like empty area here is called mini buffer or on the left side we have the echo area so for example when i do alt x you see on the bottom uh left that there's like m dash x that's basically the echo area and we call that section mini buffer we're going to talk about it uh, uh talk about it later but just to know uh, where mini buffer is whenever uh, you come across the term mini buffer then we have point basically the concept of point is the a point in the buffer so right now for example my cursor is at uh, location line 60 and uh, column 6 right that's the point that i'm in right now that's my current location and then two uh, kind of really important concepts uh, major mode and minor mode basically in emacs um, different functionalities like people break down functionalities into either a major mode or a minor mode major mode each buffer has just one major mode at a time so uh, for example right now my major mode as you can see here is org or org mode and i have bunch of like uh, the org is in white and the rest are in orange the orange uh, names are my minor modes so each buffer can have one uh, major mode at any given time and many minor modes so the major mode is just like the what to call it like yeah it's the code that uh, controls my buffer right now different like it describes the diff describes different aspect of my 
uh, current buffer, for example, right now, org mode uh, controls everything in this buffer. When I like press tab, it like collapses the uh, that header. Like it can like move a stuff up and down just because it defines in the org mode, right? And it can do many stuff. If you have a, like a Python file, the major mode would be uh, Python mode. And Python mode controls the highlighting. I don't know, like the indent and everything related to Python. And I have a bunch of minor modes. Minor modes uh, are designed for like a specific functionalities. For example, uh, to give you an example right now, I have company mode. Company mode is a minor mode that kind of a, a, it provides an API for auto completion, right? I can give it a backend based on the stuff that I have and ask like whenever I. Uh, based on some uh, criteria whenever i write something after like three or four letters it opens up a nice autocomplete uh drop down and i can choose whatever uh, my backend provides things like that or i ha uh, i have projectile which is like a project manager uh, mode for emacs things like that so uh, to summarize each buffer I can have just one major mode at a time and it can have many minor modes uh, the majority of uh, elisp libraries uh, either are a major mode or a minor mode uh, you find uh, library like some library that don't have any major or minor mode but those are kind of rare and some uh, key bindings to survive on the first day First of all, how to read key bindings whenever you uh, look at uh, any article, any tutorial, or uh, even in our uh, own slides. Uh, when you look at the key bindings, you'll see something like this thing in here, right? Sorry. Oops. Wrong key. You see something like this. Uh, oh, and you can uh, see uh, some of the examples on the right side, right? So right now here, we say, like, it's like capital C dash X, capital M dash E, four. The equal signs are not part of the key binding. It's just part of the uh, syntax of org mode. That's how you can, like, highlight a piece of information. So this thing in here means hold control press x and then hold alt and press e like i'm talking about linux like in mac os i guess it should be alt again but control will be command i don't know like it's hard to understand mac os but if you're interested there's some tutorials for mac os folks to kind of understand how key binding works on Mac OS. It's, it's quite simple, but I don't know like uh, what controls map to on Mac OS. And finally, press 4, right? M, capital M is Alt, capital C is Control, capital S is Super. In Super in like normal keyboards, like PC keyboards or like the Windows key. Um, in Mac, I don't know what it is in Mac. Sorry. So some key bindings. First of all, Emacs tutorial. If you press Control H T and then T, let's give it a shot. First of all, so Control H and T, you'll see Emacs tutorial. You can actually, I highly recommend, uh, like reading this thing. It's like it's not that long. It's like thousand lines of uh, information and small lines, not uh, like short lines, not really long lines and it teaches you how to navigate in emacs how to save files how to undo like different aspects of emacs that you need to know like bare minimum basic stuff right but if like since it's text it might be a little bit boring if you don't like this kind of stuff you can actually use this link which is like a nicer version of the same tool uh, on emacs documentations in order to quit emacs you need to do control x and control c followed by control c easily quit emacs sometimes especially at the start you get into many troubles you press some key bindings you don't know what you're doing and like it's everything seems to be messed up you just like that 
uh, lightsaber command and key binding in those kind of situation is control G. Control G basically is like cancel abort mission, like abort whatever you're doing. Even if you're in the middle of something, just press control G twice and it's gonna uh, cancel everything, right? Then we have the control H family. Control H is a family that comes like there's different variant of um, different functions for control H that provide help, like different types of help for you. For example, let me write it down here actually. We have uh, control H F, which you can search for any function. It's going to show you the help for that function. Mm, we have uh, control H V. It, oops, sorry. Me. Same as functions, it, uh, you can look at the Docker string for any variable. I'm going to show you examples. Um, Control H uh, M, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry. I have some macro on my keyboard to use, like, to uh, kind of mimics a um, mouse, and the key is really close to M. I, I make a mistake sometimes. So, Control H M is for mods, if I'm not mistaken. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's describe mod. I'm going to talk about it. Yeah in a minute oops okay so let's try control h f there's tons of functions um let's pick like actually this one All right the latest command, uh, latest uh, function that I uh, evaluated. As you can see, in a different buffer, um, there's a like a nice uh, Docker string describes what that function does, what that arg is, and basically, if I switch to any other function and keep this buffer open, this uh, window open, I can see the documentation for other functions. There's a bunch of them. Uh, basically, if you go through the if you go through the Emacs tutorial, you're going to learn about different uh, key bindings for the Control H family. That is really nice to uh, get help. Uh, get help. Oh, another one before I forget is Control H key K, which is like the key binding help. Uh, you can do like Control H Okay, and it says, okay, do whatever you want to do. I'm going to tell you uh, what you're doing. For example, you have a key binding, but you don't know what function is uh, assigned to that key binding. It, it happens quite a lot, uh, quite a lot as uh, we're going to see in the future. This is the way to find the function. For example, I want to know what control X, control F is uh, mapped to. Yep, it mapped to find file function, right? And you can see the uh, documentation for it. So most of the time, like 99% of the time, you don't need like to Google anything. Like if you're using ELISP, like it has like a giant uh, library of documentation for you. Like you can basically, it's going to be the answer for your almost all the questions you have like around 12 years ago now 12 years actually that i started to do fg42 i was doing it on a train and back then i didn't have like 4g one or anything i had just one laptop no internet connection till i get home so i basically use this kind of documentation and everything like you literally won't need anything else unless you don't know that like how to do something that's why uh that's when you want to use google or there's another thing like i propose control h a that like ask you what you want to do uh you try to come up with a, like a keyword at, and it's going to search in the documentation of emacs and tell you what function you might need and uh, actually let me add it to the list as well Oh, 
control H A, right? Um, the next key binding which is really important is Alt X or Meta X. In in a PC, M as I mentioned, capital M maps to uh, the Alt key, and Alt X basically opens up the uh, like an interface for you to run a command like and a command is literally a function it is just a function you call a function and it works right so right here as you can see the foo function that we uh, that i actually defined in that c++ file has so many functions every major mode every minor mode add some stuff in here and different libraries have some different function that you you, you can use um, most of these functions like as you can see the find file or they have a, like a, a key binding map to them as you can see find file is like control x control f or find grep is like grep dash find which is weird oh it's a, like an allies for that function so uh the main way to actually interact with uh, functions like interactively is actually uh, meta x really useful we're going to use it a lot and to show you in the actual like uh raw emacs as you can see it's, it's really a small but in the bottom left corner you can see the alt text it doesn't auto complete anything you need to take care of that in the future um to search in the buffer just control s like um, type anything you want it just and press control uh, s again it's going to search in your stuff uh, i'm using some other search alternative that uh, default like a sorry than uh, vanilla emacs but in vanilla emacs it's like this for example let's search for term this right i press control s it searches forward i press Control R, it uh, searches backward in the buffer. Um, then we have uh, save. To save a buffer, sorry. To save a buffer, all we need to do is Control X, Control S. Easy. Um, the copy pasting in Emacs is very, very different than other editors um it might take a, uh, a bit of time for you to, to basically uh, get used to it but it totally worth it by default first you need to select a region and then do either copy paste or copy cut or paste right to select the region you need to do control a space when you uh, press control a space uh, you go to select mode you can as you can see select whatever you want and that's the default mode for selecting a region there's other alternatives you can do rectangular select right i select a rectangle in my buffer and when i paste it that rectangle is going to be pasted in, in place there's like multi select to select multi part at the same time different libraries provide different alternatives but right now we stick to the bare minimum that you're going to deal with on your first day we have copy, uh, which, uh, oh, when you select your region that you want to copy, you press meta W, meta is like alt again. So alt W is going to copy or control W, which is which in Emacs is called killing, but the common term for it that you're used to is cut. And finally, using control Y, you're going to yank or paste the code. If you're coming from other editors, you're probably used to control C, control X, control V, right? The, that sequence. But believe me, like this is much useful to learn. Like I, I do control Y everywhere. But that being said, if you really want to use control C, control V, control Y, uh, what was the other control X stuff? You can there's libraries to do that in emacs as i mentioned you can pretty much do whatever you want in emacs so there's a library you can use to do whatever you want but that's the default that's what you get on the raw emacs like with no uh, configuration or no development 
then we have kill buffer you have an open buffer you want to kill it just control x k ask it, it's gonna ask you what buffer you want to kill you give it a name hit enter done right uh, to show you on the this thing control x k what to kill the tutorial yes are you sure yes kill, it's gonna kill the buffer um switch buffer so you might have different many buffers like right now if i'm going to show you i have all these buffer opened already right so many stuff um to switch between different buffers you do control x b and choose the buffer you want and hit return or enter done you switch to a different buffer sorry video yeah um to oh to show you in the actual uh, raw emacs still the same but you have to type what you want there's no auto completion or anything but there's a, like a default which is like the GNU emacs dashboard um undo is control slash right i do something i do control slash undo and finally eval expression this is really important for us uh so we're going to use it like in this episode quite a, quite a lot so when you do control x control e uh anywhere in your buffer emacs tries to, from that point backward it tries to find the first e uh, like a lisp expression that it can find and evaluate it we're going to see it in action and i'm going to uh, explain more uh, in action and finally there's a function called describe mode that control h control m does the same so whenever you don't know what to do and you want to know more about the current buffer like what you can do in a buffer all you can uh, all you want to do is to do describe the mode right you can do alt x uh, describe mode hit return and it's going to show you what minor modes you have uh, right now what libraries are you using right now and then what's your the major mode of your buffer um, some documentation about how it works and a list of uh, key bindings that are available to you it's amazing like every single key binding that you can use right now for an org buffer including the uh, key binding from your major mode and minor mode all of them are listed here so here you go like i get this question like when uh, whenever a friend of mine starts with emacs they're like oh dude how do you do this how do you do that in your emacs i'm like just uh check out the describe mode and you'll figure it out and you, you, even you you're going to learn more stuff right and for example if you don't know what of like what any of these function do just press return on it you're going to see what is like you see the help basically the help uh section of that function back to the where you came from and stuff like that that's it for the basic uh concepts and key bindings now let's talk about some lisp it, it, i know it took a little bit longer today but uh very first episode like second episode kind of uh it's important to know some of the basics so Lisp is really amazing and it takes some time to get used to it, especially if you're coming from a language uh, that is not a Lisp because you're used to uh, languages if you don't know about Lisp. You know about other languages like Python, Ruby, C, I don't know, Java, anything. You, you see some languages that are designed to look good uh, to human eyes, right? You can read, for example, Python quite well easy it's it's a nice language but one of the things that i get from people whenever i say yeah i'm a lisper i love lisp they're like oh too many parentheses yeah well so like people constantly since it's like seems awkward to human eyes uh, they seem to be uh, to think that like lisp is really weird let's have a look at how uh, lisp uh, oh before I jump to the to some code examples, uh, the difference between 
Lisp and other type of other syntax of programming languages is that when you write Python, you, you're writing uh, in a language with some syntax. But Lisp really doesn't have a syntax. It's a, like a debate in Lisp community. Some people say it does, some people say it doesn't. Both of them have valid arguments and I'm not going to uh, kind of open that door. But the fact is when you write some Lisp code, what you're doing is actually filling out a data structure. So those parentheses has a meaning. Those are just lists, some list data structure. What you're doing is you're creating lists by typing some stuff into a list, uh, into a list, sorry. And then your compiler or your interpreter knows what to do with that data structure. So there's a huge difference. And this is a small thing actually, uh, it, after, like in the future, you're going to see how important this small thing is. Um, okay, let's uh, let me show you some code. Where to look? Mm. Let me choose something that might be useful. Nah, mm, just a bunch of flags might be fun. Yeah, so. This is actually some ELISP code that I, you see right now. If you're not used to LISP, sorry, if you are not used to LISP or never saw a LISP before, this is going to look terrifying to you. Ooh, so many parentheses, like what's up with the indentation and blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to tell you some of the basic and fundamental rules and laws of list that is going to help you that are going to help you understand any list like easily right i know it's it looks terrifying but believe me if you write the same code in i don't know javascript you're going to end up and if you count the number of parentheses you're going to end up with more parentheses and brackets rather than this uh, i got uh, like i'm pretty sure that's gonna happen right just give it a try. So there are a bunch of rules, uh, simple rules in Lisp that by knowing them, you can read any Lisp. First of all, you need to know anything in Lisp, like almost 98% of stuff in Lisp evaluate to themselves. What evaluation means is that whenever you run a code, let's uh, let me show you something. So this is a, actually a rep, uh, elisp rep on the lower part of the screen. Whatever I write here is going to be evaluated as Emacs Lisp. So when I say, uh, when I type number four and press enter, what happens is my Lisp interpreter try to evaluate number four as an expression everything in lisp is an expression almost everything right so evaluating number four will result in number four itself four is number four right so as i mentioned 98 percent of the stuff in uh lisp evaluate to themselves for example if i have a string and i evaluate it it's going to evaluate to the a string itself numbers the same they're going to evaluate to themselves and things like that right there's few exceptions the first one is a symbol what's a symbol the thing that you're seeing on the screen is a symbol symbol is just a name right when you name someone like bob right that bob by itself if you forget about the person uh, that you might know just think about the name bob that Bob is a symbol. Uh, if you if if you're uh, like a in in high school, basically you had math, right? When you say, for example, a plus sorry, a plus b, a is a symbol, b is a symbol, and plus is a symbol too. A refers to a value, b refers to a value, and plus refers to an operation like adding two things together. So symbols are just names right 
but when you try to evaluate a name in elis right now you get an error right uh, what happens is elis tries to not elis please tries to figure out what value has this name what value this name is referring to like uh, what value this name is bound to right so it tries to find the value with this given name something like in elisp is like uh, is actually a variable like uh, concept but in other lisp like closure it's not a variable it's just a name for a value right too much details don't worry about that so what uh, the reality is symbols evaluates to their value the, to the value that they're pointing to if i create a value uh, a variable right now let's say a a to number 44 right if i say f a a evaluate double a for me it's going to figure out whether it uh, bound to a value it, whether it's assigned to a value or not if there is a value it's going to uh, AA is going to evaluate to that value and I'm going to see the value right yeah I see 44 that's true and another exception for the rule that almost everything evaluate to themselves is lists in order to define a list in Lisp you we use parentheses whatever that come inside the uh, comes inside the parentheses are different elements of a lisp so to give you an example right now we have a sorry we have a lisp we have a list with three elements the first element is number one then number two then number three if i evaluate it right now lists are exception in the first rule right they're not evaluated to them there so I'm going to get an error saying that invalid function one. What's that all about? So when we evaluate a lisp, what happens is evaluating a lisp is equivalent to calling a function. So what happens is the interpreter is going to look for a function called one. So the symbol one in, uh, one in here is better to be bounded to a function, which is in our case, it's not right that's why we saw the error so it tried to find a function called uh, one and then try to call it passing number two and three as parameters to it right that's how lisp evaluation works so let's define a function like i'm going to talk about the function definition and stuff like that in future episodes but for now oh we have four uh bar and let's return four right to do, do, do what uh, mistake did i made ooh, 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 ooh. sorry 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 let's go back to here so in the rep when i uh wrote the stuff and press return it evaluate the stuff but i'm going to write them here right uh and evaluate them here so let's do actually this might be better let's create a function called bar that gets one parameter x and just adds the parameter adds one to the parameter right now if i stand on the like if i move to the final parentheses at the end of the last list right and press ctrl x ctrl e right as I mentioned in the key binding section, this is like control X, control E is a binding to evaluate the previous expression, right? So what happens is Emacs try to find uh, from what we are right now, which is this line, this character in here, backward try to find one Lisp form, which in our case, is just a list, right? A list that the first element is defined, then second element is a symbol bar then another list with element x and blah 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 tries to find one expression and evaluate that expression so control x control e evaluate the expression and as you can see on the bottom left uh, 
function bar is defined then i can call function bar like this right as you can see again on the bottom left number five is printed right sorry which is the result of our function call so let's go over what happens in here first we define the function in two in a list so we have a list a define as the first first element bar symbol bar uh, another list with symbol x in it and another list with three elements but when we evaluate the function uh, definition Lisp tries to find the function called define. It necessarily doesn't have to be a function. It can be a macro or, or a special form as well, which in our case, define is, an, uh, is a special case. Um, sorry, special form. Uh, but the, the fact is the first element has to be a callable entity, callable thing, which define is. So it calls the define a special form, pass the rest to it, and define actually defines a function. And then since we have the function and we assign the name bar to it we can create another list that has bar as the first element and number four as the second four being the first argument and when we ev evaluate this list then it's going to look up the function bar and pass the number four to it call the function and return the result so uh that's fine now what if we want a list on its own right so if we want lists are like useful data structures right a linked list if we want to have a linked list in our code how do we want we can, like we can't use it anymore right because whatever we write is going to be a function call that's another exception in uh, our rule whatever so symbols doesn't evaluate to themselves uh, list doesn't uh, don't evaluate to themselves and the final one is uh, the code i don't know what to call it actually code a special form either you can write write them like this code and some expression for example list one two three or the equivalent of that and the shorter version is like single code and then list one two three as you can remember, when I uh, evaluated one, two, and three as a list on its own, it's going to uh, raise an error saying that I don't know about function number one, right? Oh, by the way, as you can see, I'm right now, my location is just after the list one, two, three, not after the code itself. So if I hit control X, control E here, it's going to evaluate the inner list inner list that contains one, two, three, not the code. But if I move one character forward, then control X, control E is going to evaluate the code, not the uh, inner list, inner list. So evaluating a code, basically what code does, it just returns whatever you give it, right? Right now, uh, a code evaluates to its parameter. Right now we passed a list uh, one two three to it and yeah evaluating it it's going to result in list one two three and similar to that the shorter version which is with um, a single code works the same right so easy peasy one thing that i forgot to tell you should i tell you now yeah why not uh another rule of a list evaluation is that whenever it finds the whenever it finds the function right we talked about this right now elis tries to emacs tries to find the bar function and pass the the first element as the the second element as the argument to that function right but our first element is a list it, a list itself what happens is since bar is a function it happens only to functions not macros not a special forms only functions Whenever we try to call a function, the first, uh, if Emacs finds that function or if any list find, finds that function, then it's going to evaluate all the parameters and then pass them to the function and call the function. So right now, 
on the after we uh, after list found the bar function it's going to evaluate uh this list in here right oops and it's going to be in the like after one step is going to be like this and then pass seven which is like the result of three plus four pass it to bar and call bar right easy now with these rules i'm going to uh, add like write them down again in conclusion but when you know jesus let's see um, yeah now that we know about the basic rules of how a uh, list works right looking at this stuff is not really terrifying anymore you have a you know that this list here it's just a list there should be a function macro or a special form called define this is just a uh, symbol and then another list probably it would be the, like the parameter list of this function um remove actual frag result like this list in here right it's easy to understand that okay there should be a function remove an actual flag and result must be some like its parameters we're going to call remove with these two parameters right now reading a list is much easier for you all you need to do only all you need to know is like what if does what let does or la what lambda does you know this kind of stuff you need to understand about these different special forms and that's really it so to quickly recap of the rules let let me actually write them um list laws let's call it right so number one is almost actually i have it in here let me copy paste it really quick almost everything come uh evaluated themselves except for um lists symbols and quotes and some other stuff that we don't talk about them just yet that's actually not the first rule the first rule would be every everything in Lisp is a expression everything in this Lisp is an expression and when you evaluate a, an expression it Lisp will replace the expression with its value right mm, of, uh, expression means thing it with its value then number two is everything evaluate to a fun uh, something to themselves beside uh, sorry beside those three and some others that we're not going to talk about and like the last rule that you need to know uh, is about list and how lists evaluate uh, actually list evaluation so by these three easy laws you can read almost any list out there a scheme common list closure whatever you name it right um this is it for today i i don't know how long uh it's gonna be but hopefully not that long but for the fundamentals uh i guess we we're ending up the episode in a like a good form in the next episode and in a uh, future episode we're going to uh, start working on raw emacs and make uh, some changes to the like default emacs because like it's easier that way and then we're going to move to fg42 to see some advanced feature and start to do uh, more work i think it's already 
operational and we can use it, it it's going to be um, easier that way thanks uh, for uh, watching and if you like my work please uh, consider subscribing to the channel and it would be really nice if you can actually clone the source code and start and work with it some of the folks already did and report some bugs thank you for uh, for your reports um i i fixed the uh, issues that um, i got and if if you want to share your feedback uh, with me please do it's so valuable to me thanks again for watching and have a great day